So friends, good morning. Thanks for inviting me. My name is Jonathan Elkind, uh, and I am a fellow at the Center on Global Energy Policy uh, here at Columbia University. I'm very pleased to welcome you uh, to our program uh, today, which is focused on uh, the U.S. energy, excuse me, U.S.-China energy and climate collaboration in the Xi-Trump era. Uh, as you will know, President Trump arrived in Beijing yesterday as part of his 12-day trip ar across Asia. Uh, all around the globe, I think it is safe to say, onlookers have been watching intently to see whether his visit yields progress on security issues on the Korean Peninsula, tensions over the South China Sea, uncertainties regarding bilateral trade, and the global international order. In regard to energy and climate, the topics we focus on at the Center on Global Energy Policy, the timing and context of his visit are no less intriguing. Just three weeks ago, President Xi opened China's 19th Party Congress declaring, by declaring that China is, quote, taking a driving seat in international cooperation to respond to climate change. On Monday of this week, Delegations in Bonn, Germany started the two-week uh, session of the 23rd Conference of the Parties under the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. This Bonn uh, COP is, of course, the first that will occur since the announcement by President Trump in the Rose Garden on June 1st of this year uh, of his intention to have the United States withdraw from the Paris Climate Agreement. And this intersection of the international climate negotiations the Paris Agreement uh, and the energy and climate policies and collaborations between the United States and China links us directly to our program today and in particular our featured speaker. David Rank uh, is a 27-year veteran of the U.S. Foreign Service. Uh, his diplomatic career culminated at the U.S. Embassy in Beijing. Uh, he served there as the Deputy Chief of Mission until the presidential election last year and when Ambassador Max Baucus departed his post at the end of the Obama administration, Dave very ably stepped into the acting position as Chargé d'Affaires, the acting ambassador. When President Trump then made his announcement on June 1st about leaving the Paris Climate Agreement, and this was, I will note, on the eve of Beijing's hosting of two high-profile U.S.-initiated multilateral co collaborations on energy and climate, Dave Rank decided that he could not in good faith continue serving in the United States Foreign Service. After he resigned, he was later quoted in the press as saying, it just didn't seem plausible that we would pull out of Paris because it's so manifestly in our interest to be global leaders rather than global outcasts. There's no other issue that unites the world like climate change. Uh, on a lighter note, his, one of his daughters uh, was uh, similarly quoted evidently from Facebook in the same uh, press coverage saying of her, of her dad, he could have taken his big ol' his big ol' ed, egghead to the private sector, but instead he has dedicated his life to the slow work of diplomacy. That's what you get for having smart kids, I'm sorry. Uh, Fake news. Uh, <laughs> as you and the audience will know well, relations between the United States and China could hardly be called simple. Uh, nonetheless, it's not an exaggeration to say that energy and climate issues have provided a positive and stabilizing force in our uh, bilateral relations in recent years. Uh, in fact, on energy and climate issues, many have said that it is hard to imagine a secure future that does not critically involve mutual accommodation of the interests and objectives of our two countries. So let us turn now to our program. Um, we will focus uh, on energy and climate collaborations in this complicated uh, time and in this complicated relationship between the United States and China. Our program today is part of the year-long speaker series organized by the Center on Global Energy Policy entitled, Where Next on Climate? Um, before we start uh, today, let me first quickly say that this event, like all of the uh, uh, public events of the, the Center on Global Energy Policy is being webcast live. It is on the record. Uh, both the full video and a podcast audio recording will be available on our website and iTunes in the coming days. And for those of you who may be watching online or listening to the podcast, I'm sorry, those of you watching online, um, uh, you can ask a question for the panelists when we get to that segment of the program. 
using the hashtag CGEP events and our Twitter handle, which is at Columbia U Energy. Again, hashtag CGEP events and the Twitter handle at Columbia U Energy. So as the first element of our program, uh, Dave, I'd like to ask you to offer some framing uh, keynote remarks, if you will, and then we'll have a panel discussion thereafter. The floor is yours, if you wish to oh, from there. there. Oh. Thanks. Yeah. John, thank you. Uh, so I, I used to have a job where I had a lot of staff, and I spoke a lot, and every time I spoke, uh, they would, of course, I never had time to write my own remarks, so I would get my remarks uh, the day before, maybe the morning of, and I would look at them and kind of sigh and say, gosh, this doesn't, doesn't really sound like me. Uh, so now I don't have a big staff, uh, and I, I have the ability to write my own remarks, which I did, and then I read them this morning, and I kind of sighed, and I thought, gosh, this doesn't really sound like me. So. <laughs> So it's not them, it's me. Uh, so I, I, uh, I'm going to do a little bit off the cuff. Uh, if I ramble a little bit, forgive me, uh, but, uh, but hopefully it'll be a little more uh, personal and from the heart. First of all, John, thanks. Uh, the last time we met, uh, it was as fellow government officials. It's, it's good to meet again. It's good to know that life goes on uh, after uh, the US government. Uh, and thanks for inviting me up here. I, uh, I should tell people that I grew up not, or as a young child, I grew up not far from here in, in Fairfield, Connecticut, which if you are a uh, New York resident or uh, from this region, you know it's a kind of an expensive suburb uh, of Chicago uh, or, or of, uh, of New York, uh, known for high housing prices. And uh, I think my father, knowing that uh, uh, we would be faced with the issues of how to deal with all of that capital appreciation uh, and knowing that if we grew up in New York, we would have an unrealistic w view of the world uh, based on, on how uh, your baseball team performs, that he moved us to a uh, kind of down-on-its-heels suburb of Chicago uh, where we don't have to pay attention uh, uh, close attention to the discussion of uh, the estate tax these days. And also, we grew up to hate all things New York, whether they are Yankee or Met, or, and this took me a while to figure out why, or Dodger even. Uh, but, you know, growing up as a, as a Cub fan, it, it did, I, I would say, prepare me to be uh, a government employee and a diplomat because it taught me. Uh, how to suffer, and it taught me uh, how to nevertheless maintain a sense of hope, how uh, uh, to think in the long term, to be an optimist, uh, but also to be a realist. Uh, and so I appreciate that, uh, uh, that contribution to my upbringing my father gave me. Uh, you know, uh, John, you talked about my departure from, uh, from Beijing uh, earlier this year. Uh, when I got back, uh, uh, one of the things, as I was sitting on the plane on the way out, I, I was trying to sort of gather my uh, uh, thoughts and my feelings about, you know, how, what were my, my emotions after the, the kind of the sudden end to a, a uh, long career, a career, career that I loved. And really, the, the, uh, the primary uh, emotion that I felt was, was gratitude, gratitude for having uh, 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 done a job that I love for uh, more than a quarter century, gratitude for having worked with really, really interesting and, and uh, uh, intelligent people from the United States and from other countries, uh, gratitude for having done a lot of really fun things that a guy from a uh, kind of down on its heels town in Chicago uh, didn't really uh, have any expectation uh, to have been able to do, but you know, also really a sense of gratitude uh, to the people of the United States for having trusted me for that quarter century to represent them overseas. So thank you uh, for those of you here today or listening uh, uh, remotely. We got back. Uh, our house was still uh, being lived in by renters, and so my wife and I bought a used car. Uh, we drove around the country uh, going to places that were as little like Beijing as we could possibly find. Uh, where the, the people were few and the air was clear. And so we went up to the north coast of the United States, up on the shores of Lake Superior. 
we drove through the Dakotas, the land where Teddy Roosevelt uh, uh, learned to love the, the outdoors, and uh, you know Teddy Roosevelt, the man who contributed so much uh, to the protection of wild places and the environment uh, that we enjoy today. We drove through Montana uh, to see my friend Max Baucus, who had been ambassador uh, in Big Sky Country, and to the Pacific Northwest, and down through the central uh, valley of California that John Muir loved. Uh, and it made me think about the legacy that was left to us as Americans by people like John Muir and, and Teddy Roosevelt. But you know, as we were doing that drive, uh, driving through Montana, the entire state was on fire. Uh, and as we drove through central California, there was a record setting triple digit heat wave and as we listened to the radio, they were reporting the first time in history that there had been two Category 4 hurricanes in the Atlantic, and now there's been a third. That in uh, the space of 72 hours, 37 trillion gallons of water fell on the city of Houston. And it made me think about, of course, the reason I left my job and the sort of legacy that we will leave behind uh, uh, for our children. And because my background is foreign affairs, I also think about the legacy that we have been left uh, of American leadership in the world. For 70 years, uh, uh, the United States has been the leader uh, or a leader of the world. And from a personal perspective, I know that, that uh, uh, we derive extraordinary benefit from the fact that uh, when an issue arises, uh, the first question that's asked in foreign capitals is, what does Washington think? And uh, let me give you an example of that. On, uh, about a little more than 16 years ago today, I was sitting in my office in Washington in the State Department. I was kind of a low-level assistant to one of our senior people sitting on the seventh floor of the State Department. Very nice view, almost as nice as the one as we're looking at now. Uh, looking out across the Potomac to the Pentagon, and uh, and of course it was September 11th, and so I had the misfortune of looking out my window uh, as the plane flew into the Pentagon, and it was within moments of that uh, that third plane hitting that I got a call from a uh, colleague from a uh, embassy uh, of another country in Washington. Uh, a longtime partner, and uh, th this colleague said, "Look, whatever you need, we will do." And if you if you've been involved in diplomacy, you know that diplomats don't make that kind of commitment easily. They don't make that kind of commitment unless they know they can. Their government will back them up. And I also knew that there is no way that this person could have had a conversation with his capital. He just knew it. Uh, he knew uh, 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 from his decades of experience that his, his country uh, would back us. And, and that's actually what ended up being the case. But as I think about our decision to leave Paris, you know, it's the one agreement uh, that unifies the world. I used to say that it unified the world except for two other countries, one of which we are bombing, but of course now Syria and Nicar Nicaragua have also signed up. So the United States is now the only country uh, that sits outside of the, the uh, agreement that unifies uh, the rest of the world, and I wonder if that question, uh, what does Washington think, or, or uh, if that call uh, would be made now. So uh, I also worry, and this is at a much uh, sort of lower level, I worry about the legacy that uh, the United States has enjoyed of, of expertise, uh, and its expertise within the U.S. government scientists and diplomats and civil servants uh, who uh, uh, do their work because they love their work, because they love the idea of service. Uh, but look, it's important to feel uh, like you're on the uh, asset side of the ledger and not the liability side. And I worry uh, of not just uh, an attitude in this administration, but a long-term attitude uh, denigrating expertise in this country, denigrating uh, commitment and service uh, by some really dedicated people. And uh, again, it's a, a legacy uh, that has been of extraordinary benefit to the United States, and I, I fear we are squandering it 
by, uh, by taking it for granted. And I think it's particularly uh, troublesome because uh, I, I think the world is as complicated as it has ever been. Uh, the sorts of challenges we face are as big as they have ever been. And really none is, is bigger than the challenge of integrating uh, China that is returning to its traditional place at the center of, of uh, international politics as the predominant power in Asia. Uh, as we try to deal with the question of how to do that, uh, the sorts of uh, resources that the United States has been able to draw on uh, will be more important than ever. Uh, I'm concerned, and this again is a long-term trend, that when the United States, when Americans think about international engagement, uh, the first and sometimes only consideration is security, is military engagement. And I think security is an important part of what the United States does in the world. Uh, but uh, 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 looking solely at American power, American influence, and American leadership as a military question, as a security question, isn't good for the United States. And to be honest, it's not what the rest of the world wants. Certainly the part of the world I'm used to, I spent most of my time in Asia. That's not what they're... Uh, interested in exclusively. They want American security commitment, but they also want the long-term commitment uh, to American leadership in areas like commerce and finance uh, and uh, the uh, steadfast uh, expression and support for American values. And th the previous administration, I'll say, uh, recognized they, I, they, uh, the Obama administration, one of the, t the uh, I think, key elements of, of the Obama administration policy in that regard was the Trans-Pacific Partnership, an effort to not only extend uh, the uh, American leadership in uh, support for uh, free trade, but also to use that as a way to extend the American uh, tradition of uh, shaping and establishing global rules, rules on things like in the TPP, environmental standards, labor standards, protection for intellectual property, uh, and, and internet governance. And they were, it was an important, I, I think, aspect of an effort to uh, cement the U.S. role in the Asia Pacific, but also uh, to help uh, guide a rising China into a strong international order. Uh, of course, it's no surprise that not just not only uh, Donald Trump, but also Hillary Clinton opposed the TPP during last year's election. But I have to say also that the Obama administration did very little to uh, uh, argue in favor of it. Having negotiated it, uh, I, uh, the strategy for passage seemed to have been to hope that Hillary Clinton won uh, and then pass the agreement in the... Uh, uh, in the lame duck session. I think that was a serious mis miscalculation even had Hillary Clinton won the election. Uh, and so that sort of brings us to where we are today uh, with Donald Trump finishing his first visit to Beijing, uh, not just as president, but, but uh, his first ever visit to Beijing. Uh, and uh, I have to confess I haven't uh, the kind of access that I used to have to uh, what was accomplished during the visit and what was announced. But from what I can see, uh, there were no particular surprises. There were some uh, announcements on, on uh, exports that probably have been previously announced uh, and we will probably take credit for again in future visits. Uh, there were parades. I am not sure there were singing children, but I suspect somewhere along the line there were singing children. Uh, but I don't see that there were any fundamental steps to uh, address some of the really uh, key issues between us. And, and uh, for me, uh, one of the primary concerns, which you see uh, reflected here in American politics, but also European politics, you see in, in uh, the politics of our partners in Asia, is, is how to integrate uh, the world's largest trading economy uh, uh, into the global trading system, an economy that is avowedly mercantilist, that, uh, uh, that now the system is straining to figure out how to deal with, with China uh, now that it has uh, returned to its place of predominance in the international order. Uh, my background and my intuition says the way to do that is you need partners. Uh, the United States has to work together, has to work with uh, our partners in Europe, with, 
in, with Japan and Australia uh, to uh, identify key priorities uh, and lay those out uh, uh, in a constructive way uh, with the Chinese. But I have to say it's made much harder uh, when we are sitting outside of Paris, when we uh, suggest that there is a relationship between our partnership with traditional allies and the balance of payments between our two countries. Uh, and, uh, and on the Chinese side, I, I suspect uh, uh, that Xi Jinping feels very little uh, motivation to change his approach uh, when he sees a counterpart who is distracted, uh, disengaged, uh, and is in an administration that is disorganized and has been distancing itself from its partners. Uh, and so I am, uh, I see reasons for despair, but I return to where I started, which is I am a Cubs fan. Uh, I take a long-term perspective. Uh, I have an extraordinary sense of optimism, not just because I have watched uh, my baseball team play for a long time uh, to no avail, but I've watched my country make mistakes, learn from them, uh, and, and uh, adjust, adapt, and, uh, and uh, re-engage. And, and so I'm optimistic that that's uh, what we will do, but I have to say that it will take courage, it will take commitment both at our political level uh, but also uh, with, uh, among the people who work for our government, but also among the American people, an understanding of the benefits of leadership uh, and, uh, and the importance of leadership, particularly at this critical time. So John, I'll stop there. But again, thank you for giving me this chance and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dave. Um, that was a, uh, a, a great way to, uh, to kick us off. Um, uh, metaphors to uh, competitive uh, sports uh, happen sometimes uh, in uh, remarks, but never so aptly as uh, uh, in the way that you have just uh, taken us through. So now we're gonna shift to um, a discussion among this uh, distinguished panel. Uh, on issues related to energy and climate in the, the Xi-Trump uh, era. Uh, just quickly to introduce those from whom you have not yet heard, uh, let me in order uh, uh, introduce Dr. Kelly Sims Gallagher, who is a professor of energy and environmental policy at the Fletcher School uh, at Tufts University, where she directs the Center uh, for International Environment and Resource Policy. Uh, Kelly served in the Obama administration as a senior policy advisor in the White House uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy and as senior China advisor in the Special Envoy, the Office of the Special Envoy for Climate Change uh, at the State Department. Um, her work focuses on energy and climate policy in both the United States uh, and China uh, and especially on the role of policy in spurring the development and deployment of cleaner and more efficient uh, energy technologies. To her left is Dr. Tony Yuan, uh, who is a uh, global energy strategist, who is the global energy strategist and leads the global macro and quantitative research units within the commodity strategy group at Citi. Uh, his recent work has examined topics on shale, oil, gas uh, and LNG, coal, power, renewables, grid integration, and climate change in the context of markets, politics, and technology. So we're very pleased to have Tony with us uh, to add that market perspective. Before he was at Citi, he worked at McKinsey and & Company and Constellation Energy's Global Commodities Group, uh, and uh, previously has held research and teaching positions uh, at uh, Penn and at Columbia University. Uh, to his left, uh, my longtime colleague and sometimes boss, uh, David Sandelow, who directs the China program here at the Center on Global Energy Policy. Uh, David uh, is the inaugural fellow of our center, 
Um, and his work, in addition to China, covers a number of other topics, uh, ranging from uh, large-scale carbon utilization uh, to electric vehicles and other topics that he can uh, touch on. David has served in senior positions at the White House, State Department, and Department of Energy, most recently in terms of his government service as Acting Undersecretary of Energy at DOE and Assistant Secretary for Policy and International Affairs. Also before that, David was at the Brookings Institution and was an Assistant Secretary uh, of State for Oceans, International Environmental and Scientific Affairs and on the NSC staff. So uh, this is, as I'm sure you will agree, a, uh, a stellar uh, collection of people from whom to hear on these important topics. And I guess I'd like to, we're going to basically have a, 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 I hope, very lively give and take here for the, uh, the next little while. I'd like to start our discussion, uh, colleagues, uh, with a question about the, the nature of um, energy and climate issues in the context of what we have uh, commented on as being a complicated uh, bilateral relation between, r relationship between the United States and China. For a long time, it was a kind of axiomatic point that the energy and climate issues provided constructive, stabilizing uh, uh, ballast, if you will, uh, in the face of otherwise quite complicated uh, interactions. And I guess I'd like to pose the question to the panel, um, do you think that's still the case? Um, uh, are energy and climate issues uh, still central in that constructive way, or have, uh, have times moved on? Um, maybe, David, I could start with you, and we'll... I, I think energy issues are still central, and climate issues are not. Um, and I think it's, it's helpful to step back to see the broader context of where we are in a bilateral, uh, in our bilateral relationship. Um, and the past 24 hours have been very instructive in that regard. Um, the you, summitry between the U.S. and China now dates back several generations. Um, ever since um, Mao Zedong and Richard Nixon met 45 years ago, every U.S. president has met with his Chinese counterpart and every Chinese leader has met with his, his U.S. counterpart. In that several generation span, there has never been a time in which the U.S. leader was weaker and the Chinese leader was stronger than what we just saw in the past 24 hours. Um, Donald Trump's weakness is particularly striking in this regard. He comes to this relationship with the most, the, the worst poll ratings of any U.S. president in the modern era, which was underscored by election defeats. But, um, just in the past couple of days. He comes without treaty, uh, without um, alliances that most U.S. presidents has, have come with. And he comes without a, um, a team of capable um, uh, sub-cabinet appointees who were able to advance his agenda in a way that most um, other presidents have come. So he came to this relationship very weak. And then um, uh, President Xi, in contrast, came with remarkable strength. And the 19th Party Congress concluded uh, within the past several weeks, he consolidated power in a way that no Chinese leader has since Deng, Xiao, Deng Xiaoping. So I think that's, that's the broad context. Um, in, in that context, to, to, to um, answer the question on energy and climate, I, I think energy remains an important part of the relationship that Trump administration came to this seek, uh, uh, summit seeking bilateral deals on energy. The tr uh, Trump administration is extremely interested in particular in exports of fossil fuels. Um, to China, and there have been apparently some commercial announcements uh, uh, in, in that regard. Um, climate has uh, is, is been, uh, it, it's been moved from the center of the table to completely off the table um, in the bilateral relationship between the two governments, uh, between the, the, um, the, at, the, at the national level, although there remain very strong relationships at the subnational level, which I'm sure we'll get into. Dave, I wonder if you have a perspective on that. The uh, announcements. Um, out of today's uh, meetings include uh, a, an announcement on the development, the, the prospect of development of the Alaska LNG uh, system, which would involve uh, Sinopec, uh, the Chinese Investment Corporation, Bank of China, the State of Alaska, and the Alaska Gas Line Development Corp, uh, up to 20 million tons per annum of uh, LNG export, up to $43 billion of investment. Uh, in addition, there's a, uh, an MOU that has been signed with the state of West Virginia for 
as much as $83 billion worth of uh, shale gas, uh, electric power, and chemicals development. Um, what do you make of these uh, announcements? Uh, are they uh, projects that you think uh, will end up being developed in the end? Do they suggest that energy is uh, still central uh, to the U.S.-China relationship? I, I will kick the question to Tony pretty quickly. I guess I am reminded of going to Old Navy where I buy most of my clothes and the signs are always, you know, up to 90% off and you find out that one thing is 90% off and everything else <laughs> is the same old price. Look, up to $83 billion could mean nothing, right? Uh, on LNG, certainly, uh, and Tony, maybe I'll kick it to you, uh, I mean, it, there's a market in, in natural gas, and you know the up the uh, uh, prospects for increasing our our exports, I think, depend really on on where the market stands, and and uh, so you know I think that side of it, it it will be it's interesting, and the fact that the United States is a big producer of of natural gas now uh, makes that sort of thing plausible where it wasn't in the past. But I think the markets will still decide uh, on on the climate side of things. Uh, I'm not at all surprised that there was nothing said on climate, right? I mean, our our uh, our president has no interest in in discussing climate uh, with the Chinese president, and I think the Chinese, even though they are uh, truly concerned about climate, they're also, uh, I think, enjoying the fact that they have, without having to increase their commitment in any way, uh, in terms of what they're going to do to address climate, they found themselves in a position of uh, sole position of leadership. So. Why, why push Washington to do more when uh, it's, it's uh, as, uh, on, at the level of geopolitics, uh, it's extraordinarily helpful to Xi Jinping. So with that, Tony, well, I'll kick it to you. Well, let, let's come back to the, to the uh, climate leadership issue, but uh, uh, Tony, uh, I wonder if you might have any comments on the Old Navy principle that, uh, <laughs> uh, that uh, Dave Rank just identified. In fact, it's quite interesting that you see a role reversal between the two countries. So first off, of course, on the market side, um, now China is a buyer, and historically, the US would be the one that is directing foreign direct investment to other countries, right? In terms of markets, whether we need the LNG from Alaska, uh, perhaps we can look at sort of several things, right? One is Carter decided to debottleneck its own LNG at basically minimal cost. Uh, Russia got Yamal done at on budget, on time in the Russian Arctic under sanction. That's quite impressive. And loss of gas up in the Arctic. And then U.S. Gulf Coast LNG as well. So um, it's pretty uh, modular. The upstreams develop, the midstreams develop. And, um, and so all you need to do is basically almost like puck and play at the onshore liquefaction facilities or offshore FLNG as well. So then, you know, Alaska probably could you know, develop maybe at some point, but you know, in the foreseeable future, might be, uh, it may not be the priority. But I think the broader sense is that the role reversal is quite interesting on three levels. So I use the Chinese pounds on, you know, Xi Jinping now has his thoughts enshrined in the Constitution, right? So I said three levels, the thoughts, and um, the uh, basically the principles and thoughts, uh, the policies and also the economics aspect, how you have this role reversal. So Xi Jinping recently just, you know, in the, uh, his big speech talked about you know, environment more than many other concepts. Talk about beautiful China as one being concept, right? So versus, you know, uh, U.S. now more America first. And then on the policy front, China has been cutting coal uh, production as, or at least try to do that, uh, reducing coal fire generation, and then you know, supporting electric vehicles. Now the US supporting coal, and then try to use the, uh, direct the energy department to FERC to develop f uh, more fuel-specific uh, uh, policies as well. So that's a reversal, uh, different sets of, uh, on the policy front. And on the economic side, China has asset finance for renewables was over $110 billion in 2015 and over $80 billion in um, in 2016 on asset finance and renewables. U.S. right now, if you look at the tax, um, uh, tax proposal, it's essentially not only cut corporate tax, which hurts the tax equity aspect of renewables, but also changes, it is a detail, the renewables um, uh, inflation aspect of, um, of the economics. So then the renewables industry uh, development here in the U.S. might actually uh, take a step, substantial step back 
if the current form of the tax uh, uh, changes were to pass. So it was actually quite an interesting reversal. So I would you know, like to hear what other people's aspect and Kelly's uh, thoughts on that too. Well, and Kelly, so like, as I turn to you for your thoughts on this, the, the, the role of energy and climate issues in today's and, and tomorrow's U.S.-China relationship, I'd also like to ask you uh, then to uh, give some uh, perspective, if you will, on this role that China now has had thrust upon it, I guess I would say, uh, as an environmental leader and your sense as to whether this is something based on your uh, experience dealing with Chinese counterparts, whether this is, some, this is a leadership role that uh, China appears to welcome or something different from that. So first the, uh, the overall role of energy and climate and then the role of China as environmental leader, please. Well, I remember not that long ago energy and climate was not considered a top tier issue in the U.S.-China relationship. I mean, we sort of take that for granted now, but in fact, that was not true even, I don't know, five, between five and 10 years ago. And I remember as someone who's always worked on that issue, sort of being derided as like, this is not a serious foreign policy issue for the United States and China. And so the achievement of uh, President Xi and President Obama's uh, joint announcement on climate change in 2014 and then their follow-up announcement in 2015 was really notable not only because of its significance for the climate and the fact that it catalyzed the Paris Agreement, but it was certainly notable for the fact that finally climate change became a top-tier issue and, and moreover became the, the so-called bright spot in the relationship. And that, I think, was immensely important. And at the same time, we saw, um, I think, that the Chinese viewed this issue as <clears throat> an opportunity for them to begin shouldering global leadership uh, around a global issue where they felt a sense of responsibility to act. And, and that is also unusual for China, um, though I think becoming, you know, this is, this is a, a shift that they are trying to become more of a global leader. Um, <clears throat> now that uh, President Trump has withdrawn or has announced his intention to withdraw from the Paris Agreement, I think China is actually in an uncomfortable position for global leadership. I think they did not seek to be the sole leader. They sought to be a joint leader. They sought to work together with other major powers, uh, the United States, the EU, uh, and, and really anyone else who was willing to work with them. Um, and I think they took great comfort in the existence of a multilateral agreement um, that, made, that gave them uh, very strong uh, backing for taking hard steps at home. Right. And the hard steps at home are trying to transform an economy that still relies 62% on coal as fast as they are trying and as hard as they are working to shift to non-fossil energy. And also, you know, achieving a massive and very deep economic reform that requires them to shift from heavy industries like iron and steel to lighter service-based industries that are much less resource intensive. And so they, they welcomed the international agreement because it helped justify the kind of painful reforms that they are trying to um, implement at home that, that cause labor uh, to suffer and you know, really big dislocations in the Chinese economy. I'd like to pick up on that last point about the interplay between China's international profile on these issues uh, and the uh, reforms and evolution of the Chinese energy sector that is taking place domestically. And David, uh, as somebody who uh, has been visiting China uh, since, what is it, 1981, uh, I remember your photo of uh, uh, Shanghai, the, the, the riverfront 
in those days versus the, the, the current uh, picture. Um, obviously, you've seen a lot of that change happen. Um, uh, do you agree with Kelly's uh, point that uh, uh, China's international leadership uh, was uh, a force by which it could rein reinforce its uh, domestic actions? And what do you think have been kind of the, the key features of that domestic evolution that you think uh, were most central? I, I, I do agree with, with Kelly's point strongly, and it's, it's remarkable to think about the history of, of China over the course of the past you know, several decades since I first went in, you know, as you say, in, in the early 1980s. I mean, I flew into a Shanghai that had almost no lights at night. And, and, and that summer, not only were there no iPhones to call home with, there was, there was literally one telephone line in the entire city of Shanghai that we could use to call back to the United States. And, and since, but since that time, the, the government of China has literally, has waged the most successful anti-poverty campaign in the history of humanity. Period is lift, lifted 500 million people or so, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, and turned China from a desperately poor country to one that you know now with a, a booming economy and great wealth and in, in, in lots of the country. But but it has done so um, at a cost in a number of different respects, and one of the most striking costs has been in the environmental realm. And I mean China's cities are desperately polluted and um, the, you know the, the air quality there is in many cities is horrific um, and and this is for, this is an issue that's of great concern to many many uh, you know to, to uh, Chinese uh, people and it's a, it's a really top tier political issue and, and one of the top priorities of the Chinese government today is Dave has already underscored Dave, others have underscored um, in the in the um, is is addressing that and Xi Jinping um, spoke to this in his opening um, remarks at the 19th Party Congress and, and gave the issue priority. And, and the fight against climate change aligns in some very important ways with the fight against local air pollution. Um, and the fight against um, climate change also aligns with another strategic goal, which is developing markets for export goods and cultivating industries of the future. So, so I think there's a lot of alignment between what China is doing in fighting climate change and other important priority uh, policy objectives that it has. Well, but in China, as in the other parts of the world, including in this country, uh, I, I guess my observation would be these aren't simple uh, uh, transitions to, to undergo and that they end up with lots of different elements uh, uh, to the, the, the transitions. Um, this kind of takes us to one of the critical questions, which is the role of coal in the uh, Chinese economy. Uh, and I'd like to turn there. I, I call to the attention of the, the group, although uh, many of you will know this already, that um, as is true in the United States, where we end up with this fight over whether there is a war on coal, uh, one of the features that makes this uh, transition, the fuel switching uh, uh, transition complicated, um, is what happens to the communities and the, and the workforces that have relied, for example, on coal development uh, historically. Now, in China, there's an additional complication that uh, uh, natural gas as one of the alternative fuels um, is more expensive on a on a, a BTU basis uh, than gas. Uh, the uh, Japan Korea marker price currently is hovering around nine dollars and thirty five cents per uh, million BTU. Notwithstanding that fact, uh, there have been uh, really uh, uh, noticeable, uh, I would say, market increases. Uh, in natural gas consumption in China. Um, Year-to-date consumption is 18% above last year. Uh, through this summer of 2017, monthly consumption levels were roughly 30% above 2016 levels. And this suggests that uh, there is uh, a change that is happening in the policy making. So let me ask if I could, um, uh, first, Tony, uh, what is your sense of where the role of coal is going overall in the Chinese fuel mix? Uh, do you think that, I know some people are talking about the possibility that Chinese emissions may already have peaked, will come on to their nationally determined contribution under the Paris structure uh, in a minute, but how do you see these dynamics? Do you see uh, a start and stop transition or do you see the, 
these uh, shifts away from coal as being something that are, uh, are a, now a, a baked in part of China's energy future? Well, thanks for that. Um, so I think there's a conflict between sort of long-term goal and the short-term reality. So long-term goal is that, you know, the government talked about policies that are re you know, declining uh, or reducing the, the coal share of primary energy in China. Uh, and we sort of four years ago wrote about the peak coal demand in China happening this decade. Uh, we might have seen or could be seeing peak coal demand soon. It's just that- Peak uh, coal demand. Peak yes. coal demand, Thank you. yes. So people thought of peak supply and all of different things like oil, but peak demand is the, now the, all the rage. Um, and so then, you know, you can see that they try to reduce the coal production with the production cuts, right? And then shifting of coal-fired generation plants and shutting them down or substantially reducing investment. If you look at FIDs, final investment decisions, the one made after the Paris Agreement, there was a substantial fall off as well. So then there seems to be, at least in that direction, you know, reduced investment, reduced uh, reliance on coal. But in a short term, reality was that um, the Chinese government tried to cut production of coal, uh, partly because of mental reasons, uh, safety reasons, but partly it might be economic uh, for the coal companies. But then it brought, into, brought about a shortage of coal for power generation. So then they relaxed the whole supply cut policy on coal production. And then suddenly um, China were importing more coal um, and then burning more coal this year than last year, uh, just so that they can meet the short term um, demand for electricity. Um, and that's why coal prices, international coal prices, which were forecast to be coming down over the, in the next few years quite substantially. In fact, in the last 18 months, prices rose by basically double from about $50 per ton to now $100 per ton. So, so that means that yes, the long term seems to be there, but the short term, there's a lot of realities that you have to work through. John, can I jump in to say Please, that yeah. some of our colleagues at the Center on Global Energy Policy have written a terrific report on exactly this topic. So anybody interested in coal and, and what's happened in the U.S. and the impact of Chinese imports, I go to our website, please, and look at it. Uh, that's an important reminder, David, that uh, although we're focused on China today, uh, no country exists as an island in energy markets globally, and particularly not uh, China as the the, the world's largest everything when it comes to coal especially, but uh, also uh, to oil and other forms of energy. Uh, Dave, I, I'd like to come to you on the, uh, the kind of socioeconomic aspects of this transition away from coal. At times, I think that it has been very hard for people outside of China to understand um, uh, how enduring the changes are. I, this is in part because uh, at the very same time that one sees very ambitious uh, objectives in the climate space, and we'll come on to the NDC in a moment, um, one also sees uh, continuing plans for uh, new coal-fired power plant development, uh, coal to gas uh, uh, development out in the, in the west of China, which would amount to moving uh, pollution rather than reducing it. Um, I'd be interested in your perspective on um, how much of a uh, uh, political challenge it is for the Chinese leadership to navigate these waters and to figure out um, the socioeconomic implications uh, of this kind of energy transition. Sure, boy, I mean, they're socio socioeconomic. I mean, there are uh, the, the folks who work in Coal, the coal industries and these dirtier industries, but then there are also sort of the competing in, uh, interests, the, this kind of interests that we have, the, the state grid, the, uh, the coal industry itself. Uh, it, is a, it is, you know, any policy that affects that much of the economy uh, is, is going to have, uh, it's going to be a real challenge. My, my uh, I guess the perspective I take was the mid-1990s, the, the first time I worked in Beijing, and uh, watching as they took on the first time uh, uh, indebted state-owned industries. And they looked around and, and, I mean, the system essentially said, we're gonna get out of the cradle to grave business. 
and we're going to get out of the pension business and the housing business and the where am I going to work for the rest of my life business and leave that to the market to a greater degree. And uh, it was wrenching. There were, at that point, tens of millions of people on the street. But I think the, uh, the, the government and the state understood that, they, uh, that the, the path that their state-owned industries w w uh, w was on uh, was just not sustainable. Uh, and uh, and uh, they were able to, uh, through a number of mechanisms, one, I mean, uh, accessing the significant uh, uh, economic resources the government has to uh, not uh, not make uh, uh, redundant workers whole, but at least make them uh, give them enough money to keep them off of the streets, uh, keep them off the streets protesting, and not necessarily keep them off the streets looking for work. Uh, and I think they're probably looking at the same sort of thing this time. You know, what are what's the what is the fiscal cost of, of, you know, what are the number of workers and the number of people involved in the industry that we're going to have to uh, take care of and what's that going to cost us and how do we drive those costs down and those sorts of considerations they're looking at now. Kelly, I'd like to ask you to come in on this and, and if I could just as an add-on, um, from your time at the uh, OSTP, the Office of Science and Technology Policy in the White House, I know that you watched a great deal some of the, the collaborations that were underway, the technical collaborations across the U.S. government with China, one of which was the U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center, or CERC, where uh, coal technology, and in particular carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration, uh, was one of the, the key elements of focus. So could you please comment on th uh, this discussion about where coal is going in China? and? And if you would, as well, just a little bit on what you see as the importance of that kind of bilateral collaboration, such as in CERC, uh, what that will be going forward. Okay, well, I wanted to just, uh, I will answer that question, but I wanted to say something about the socioeconomic transition, because I had an interesting experience this summer in Shandong province uh, that gets to, I think, one of the hardest issues which in China, which is that <clears throat> the central government, I think, has really faced up to this challenge with very open and clear eyes and recognizes, you know, all of the challenges before them and they've made some hard but decisive choices. And, and they've clearly chosen to, to proceed with economic reform. They've clearly chosen to try to shift to clean energy um, and to reduce coal. Uh, consumption, but the question is how, and, and that is really the heart of the of the problem. And I think uh, a particular challenge is that uh, so many of the industries in China are state-owned enterprises, and the state ownership is usually at the provincial level or local level. So when I was in Shandong Province this summer, I met with the head of the um, Provincial Development Reform Commission. And, you know, he was telling me that he had had to shut down four iron and steel companies in Shandong uh, that year so far, this year, this year so far. And I said, well, what did you do with all the workers? And he said, well, we are still trying to find all of them jobs. So these local governments actually have direct responsibility because they own these companies for finding alternative jobs, doing the retraining, um, and making making these transitions. Uh, so it's really serious, and I think there's other big challenges that are complicated to talk about in a short time, but power sector reform is, I think, one of the big, big challenges confronting China. Uh, reform of its feed and tariff uh, is another important task. Uh, but on the plus side, they're very clear about their non-fossil target, and their, their decision to have 20% of non-fossil fuels by 2030 uh, as a proportion of their energy supply. And as Tony said, making massive investments um, in alternative energy. So um, I think that they're conflicted on this question of coal with carbon capture and storage, to be honest with you. Uh, for many, many years, as David and John and I all know, uh, there's been a, a large uh, R&D program in China on advanced coal technology and to a lesser extent 
um, I, an R&D program on carbon capture and storage. And during the Obama administration, I think it was you, David, that set up the U.S.-China Clean Energy Research Center uh, that originally had four components. And this topic of advanced coal with CCS was one of the areas of, of research. It's been a really successful uh, collaborative research center where the U.S. and China were sharing costs, tremendous buy-in from the private sector in both countries. I think it's leveraged like $140 million. A very small $5 million investment <laughs> has leveraged a huge amount of money from the private sector. Um, but I don't know how that will continue under the current administration. To be right. honest with you, I don't. I think funding I is, no is clearly an issue. Look, with an eye on the clock, I'd like to shift over now to use your comments there, Kelly, as a as a good pivot to the Chinese uh, pledge under the Paris structure, uh, and then also to uh, what I think for many is a very uh, exciting though uncertain prospect, and that is uh, Chinese plans for emissions trading um, at a national level. When it comes to the nationally determined contribution, the Paris Pledge, um, as Kelly mentioned, uh, that pledge includes uh, to increase the share of the energy mix coming from non-fossil sources to 20% by 2030, which that increment only of the non-fossil would be larger than the installed capacity of Germany at, president, at present. Excuse me. Um, also to have the country's greenhouse gas emissions peak before 2030 and earlier if possible uh, to include to uh, reduce emissions intensity uh, by 60 to 65 percent using a 2005 uh, baseline by the year 2030 and also other elements. Um, I, I am interested to get uh, a, a sense of the panel's reactions to this program of activities. Are these activities that China would have been doing anyway? Um, I'd also just like to introduce one of the points that has again and again been used as an attack line by those uh, not favoring the Paris Agreement in this country who have said, quote, China doesn't have to do anything until 2030. How do you view this set of commitments uh, and the notion that China uh, implicitly isn't share, uh, shouldering its share of the overall burden. David, you want to kick off? The, the attack line you mentioned is totally silly. Uh, it's, it, it is only uttered by um, kind of a, some people in this country. It's, it's, uh, it's kind of like saying, uh, I, I'm going to cut, I'm going to reduce my weight by 10 pounds by the end of the month. That's great. I don't have to do anything until the 30th of the month. I mean, uh, chi China aspires to and is committed to continuing to grow its economy uh, up into 2030 and beyond 2030. Um, there's no way it can continue to do that after 2030 unless it transitions uh, its energy base. Um, and so there's a lot of work that needs to be done between now and 2030 in order to meet even the peaking pledge of 2030. And then there's other components of the, of the nationally determined contribution, which you mentioned, all of which require immediate work. Um, um, uh, the, the Chinese government has very ambitious um, uh, programs with respect to the transition to clean energy. It's, I mean, China has, um, uh, it, it has the biggest it, um, uh, renewable energy development program in the world, more solar deployment, more wind deployment, more hydro deployment than any country in the world. Uh, almost a third of the nuclear plants underway uh, uh, in construction in the world today are, are happening in China. China is committed to a price on carbon. Uh, as you alluded to, and, and um, is, institute, is, is launching an emissions trading program uh, o, o in the years ahead. So there's a lot of work underway right now to address the climate change issue in, in, you know, in China. There's, it's, it's aligned to other, priority object, other policy objectives, as we've already said, um, but there's a lot of work and, and a lot of serious attention to this at this point in China. Tony, let me ask you for a market perspective, in particular on the, uh, on the emissions trading uh, idea. So the introduction of emissions trading, greenhouse gas emissions trading in China, uh, essentially means the creation of a new class of securities in China. Uh, but one is talking about a, uh, a country where the availability of basic data, data and statistics about the operation of the energy sector um, is, I would say, at best um, 
uh, late, uh, not very well developed, uh, and certainly not widely available. Mm -hmm. So can markets, do you anticipate that markets will have confidence in the, uh, the veracity of the information that underlies uh, a Chinese emissions trading scheme? This is a great question, actually, because if you look at multiple fi uh, financial markets in China, come uh, stock market uh, about a year or so ago, and then commodity markets uh, early this year, basically prone to spreads, right? Not stability, but prone to spreads, not really trading on fundamentals. And here's if you have the emissions trading program, and the data issue is quite important. So if you don't have clear data, uh, good data, then how do you know, you know at what price an emission permit should be traded? And what kind of fundamental information do you have? Or is it going to be prone to boom bust cycle as well, where suddenly, oh, this is, you know, it looks like the price of something is going to rise, so therefore there might be a mad dash into that security or something like that, and then prices rise and then collapse again. But I don't think that this is a, um, a perhaps on environmental front, a unique situation that happens in China, in that um, it will take some time for the system to develop. For example, if you look back at the U.S. emissions trading program, SO2, the NOx and whatnot, prices, I remember it was, uh, it was NOx, I think. Prices went from like 1,500 bucks a ton or 1,000 uh, bucks a ton of emission permit to $5,000 in months and then before it collapses. And so then I think um, there's some, certainly there might be teething problems here and there. It might take China a little longer if the data tr transparency issue is not solved. Uh, but it might actually be, you know, uh, get rectified sooner because it seems like the central government really wants to get uh, something done on pollution and whatnot. Another aspect that's related to that, quite important, is power trading. Because as much as you can trade emissions, the thing that generates emissions is, you know, out of the three components, industrial rule, uh, transportation, and power generation, the power uh, trading aspect could also be quite important in terms of putting an economic uh, way to uh, adjust, you know, what kind of power generation you might have, whether, you know, prices of uh, emissions would actually curtail more uh, fossil fuel generation uh, um, aspect. Well, thank you. I think that that reminder is very important that um, the complexities of intro introducing big fundamental uh, uh, elements of, of the future aren't easy uh, and, and aren't always uh, super smooth. So I think that's a, a useful reminder. We're about to switch over and invite uh, questions uh, from those of you in the audience. Uh, I'm going to just ask whether um, other panelists have anything that they want to contribute on this last point. Uh, so I would like to encourage you to start preparing questions. I will ask for actual questions, not statements. Um, and I'll ask you to be as compact as possible uh, in posing your question. There's a microphone that's over here on my left. And I'd ask those of you who are interested to pose a question to go to the microphone. Um, uh, and, and in a moment, I'll, I'll call on you in turn. To the panelists, anything else you want to contribute on this last point. The only thing I, I'd say is it gets back to David on the uh, Shanghai waterfront in 1981. Uh, I, I was there in 1990, or 19, yeah, 1990 and uh, at the consulate, and uh, part of my job was to take delegations around uh, the city, American officials, that sort of thing, and, and sort of introduce them to local leaders that's, uh, and brief them on the on the, the state of the city and the region. And Shanghai municipal authorities would uh, trot out this giant map of uh, the uh, land across the, the water from, from mm -hmm. the municipal building, Pudong, uh, with its gleaming rows of skyscrapers and, and uh, buildings. And of course, you know, we live there and you look across the river and there's nothing there. You know, there's a couple of uh, shabby buildings and, and a lot of empty land. And, uh, and you look at the Chinese officials rolling it out. This is 1990. It was maybe a little uh, more prosperous than when you were there, David, but not that much. And you know, in the winter time, they'd have their long underwear sticking out from underneath the sleeves of their shirts. And you think, what are you know? Uh, that it's just not plausible. These sort of big uh, uh, plans, uh, you know, that this that, that these people cannot possibly carry that out. And I try to keep that experience in mind when I hear talk about. 
uh, big plans like carbon emission trading and that sort of thing. Uh, not everything has uh, succeeded, like, of course, if you go to Shanghai today and look at Pudong, all of those gleaming buildings are now there. Uh, but, but uh, you know, when the Chinese government uh, sets its mind to do something, uh, I, I do not rule it out. So, so I would put uh, mm -hmm. the carbon Thank you for that. That's a that. great uh, uh, note of perspective. So as a reminder for those who are listening on uh, live stream or podcast, today's program focuses on U.S.-China energy and cli climate collaborations in the Xi-Trump era. Uh, and so we're going to now switch over to audience uh, questions. Uh, those of you who are watching on the live stream uh, can send questions into us uh, using, uh, wait for it, uh, hashtag CGEP events and the Twitter handle at Columbia U Energy. Could I ask those of you posing questions to please uh, keep it compact? Please identify yourself and indicate whether it, this is a question to a particular member of the panel. Please, sir. I'm Charlie Kimball with the Korea Center for International Finance. Uh, solar panel industry, what should the United States do? Isn't this an industry where you have declining costs because of the learning curve? If we let China be mercantilist, won't they gather the whole market eventually? Shouldn't we have some form of protection? Or should we just buy the cheapest available? Great question. Thank you. Who wants to kick us off on that one? I'm happy David? to start. Um, so first, a little bit of background for those who aren't following this. There's a very live policy. of tariffs um, will lead to some pretty significant job losses. That could actually be compounded by something that Tony talked about earlier, which is changes in the tax code, which could further disadvantage the U.S. industry. Um, so it's a very large issue. Um, I have a pretty strong view on the question you answered, which is that tariffs are, in general, a bad idea and a bad idea here, and that when that interference with, with free trade um, is a, a net cost to uh, the economy and that, that we shouldn't be imposing them. I do think there's one feature of this whole issue that has not gotten enough attention, which I think we'll get more, um, which is that um, what's looming right now is not just a U.S.-China solar trade war, but a U.S.-China energy trade war. Because I, I, I think it is, I, I rarely make predictions, but let me make this. Uh, I think that there is a zero chance that if the U.S. imposes tariffs on Chinese solar panels, that China will fail to retaliate. I don't think that's in their playbook. I think if the, if the U.S. imposes tariffs, China will impose retaliatory tariffs of some kind. And it will, if past this prologue, it's highly likely to look for a place that would be of most political pain to the administration. So you can, I, I suspect, without knowing it, just speculation, that Chinese diplomats are, and Chinese analysts are looking at ways, you know, could they impose tariffs against coal uh, exports from the United States, for example, um, in a way that would be um, hurtful to Donald Trump and his political base. So, uh, or, or maybe LNG, or I, I don't know, but I sus th those conversations may be underway. And I think we face a risk of, of a U.S.-China energy trade war if we start with the imposition of tariffs in this area. Very good. Um, unless others want to come in, I'm going to go ahead to the next uh, question. Dr. Vijay Modi from the from uh, engineering. engineering school. Uh, so sh hopefully short question. Absolute numbers in China always look big. Uh, private sector, extremely vibrant, poised to make huge impact on electric mobility, not just in China, but worldwide. Yet 
my question is in not 2030 but looking ahead to 2040 do you see electricity to power that vehicle and for other purposes potentially coming from fracked gas because china geologically has quite a bit of gas that could be fracked and local or do you see it skipping that phase and getting it replaced predominantly by uh, renewables? So that's my question. Great question, Vijay. Thank you. And, and in particular, I, I pick up on the comment that was made by Kelly about some of the need for power sector uh, reform and evolution, changes to the feed-in tariff, the, the curtailments issue, which has been a problem not only in China but elsewhere. Uh, I was struck by some data that I saw that said that the uh, installed capacity of renewables, solar in particular, in the United States is hugely uh, less than, than China's, yet the actual dispatched megawatts exceed because of some of the problems. Kelly, do you want to jump in on the crystal ball element of Vijay's question and what the future uh, uh, supply to, the, to the, you know, powering the grid looks like? Yeah. But as I understood your question, it was also about EVs and, and whether there was going to be an EV versus CNG sort of future. Oh, I, no, I mean, no. if EV is the future. If it's the future, the what will it be fuel? What's the powering the, e what's the EVs? Okay. Yeah. So, so first of all, this is another example of where the Chinese have made a very clear decision about where they want to go, and that is EVs, period. Um, I think that the reason why they made that decision was in part due to energy security concerns, not wanting to import as much oil, in part because they view it as consistent with their low carbon growth strategy, and they are determined to move towards non-fossil energy. Um, and I don't think that they're counting on the availability of a lot of fracked gas, though they would love it if they could exploit it. It's just proving to be much more expensive uh, and technologically challenging than they thought. The, the nature, the geologic uh, conditions of China shale gas are totally different from here in the United States. So I think that they're, they're primarily planning on renewables and nuclear. As, as their future electricity supply sources. And, um, and in order to really make those reality, they have some policy challenges. And one of them is power sector reform because there's a lot of protectionism within the provinces. And they don't like accepting renewables from neighboring provinces. Uh, they are protecting their local coal company, coal power company. Um, so th this is sort of what I mean about these socioeconomic challenges. And while the feed-in tariff has been tremendously successful so far in spurring the construction of new renewable farms, basically, um, there's been a lot of trouble uh, getting the payment structure to work well. And so the business model has been quite challenging for a lot of Chinese renewable developers. Um, but, you know, these are, I feel like these are short-term, in a way, <laughs> short-term issues. Like, they, they are very serious policy challenges, uh, but I, I believe, I wouldn't bet against the Chinese working to resolve those policy challenges. The direction is clear, and, and so it's just a question of, of time. Uh, David, I, I'm going to jump Dave in. One, please. I know, David, Dave, you right. don't make predictions. I am really comfortable on this one to make a prediction, <laughs> uh, primarily because it's so far out that you will have forgotten uh, <laughs> that I made it. But Kelly, I, I think you're exactly right. I mean, I think the, the just the sort of the economics and the politics of skipping fracking uh, are, are probably make it likely that they'll just try to go to renewables and, and nuclear. David uh, Sandler, please. I. Uh, I agree that there'll be a big push toward, and there is a big push uh, towards renewables and nuclear. I think that the prospect for natural gas growth in China is very, very strong. Um, that that uh, I, right, I mean, China right now um, uses far less natural gas as a percentage of its total primary energy than the global average, um, and there's. Um, you know, uh, natural gas is a, it a very, um, you know, a versatile fuel that can be used in, in, uh, in lots of different ways. It can be used to balance uh, renewables. 
Um, chi uh, Chinese government is looking to bring in natural gas um, uh, in all kinds of ways, uh, you know, pipeline gas, LNG. It's looking for opportunities for production. Um, I agree there have been challenges in, in, sh in, in shale production, but I think they'll seek to overcome that. So I, uh, I, I guess I, I, think there's, I, think, I think we will see pretty significant growth in, growth in natural gas as a percentage of the Chinese primary energy mix over the course of the next couple of decades. David, I recall the, the piece that you wrote a couple of years ago uh, that highlighted the difference in terms of the legal and regulatory structures that are re required for shale gas development in China as opposed to what is on the books presently and the established practice. Yeah. Do you see changes happening there? Uh, there, there have been some changes. It's, I mean, it's very striking in, in, um, in China there's both below ground challenges, which Kelly was just talking about, the, the uh, shale's a lot deeper and harder to access. It's, it's, a lot of it's in mountainous areas. There's also above ground challenges in producing shale gas, including market structures. Um, uh, traditionally, uh, upstream uh, oil and gas production in China has only been allowed by, um, to, to several large state-owned companies. Um, and so we, there hasn't been the opportunity for the kind of dynamic entrepreneurial um, type of activity we've had in the United States. Um, there's some move towards changing that. Um, right now in China, there's more private activity uh, in this sector, but it's, it's reasonably slow. Tony, I think you wanted to come in, and then we'll go to the next challenge sure. for the question. So I think the question is actually quite important, and I want to hear what uh, David, later, perhaps later on, will have to say on the gas side. The reason why electric vehicles are actually quite important is because not only environmental side, but actually China has a technological advantage and a market share advantage in batteries. Japan, Korea, China dominate the battery making. People talk about gigafactory in the U.S. as, as this is like the only thing in town, but China has multiple gigafactories. Um, and so then certainly EVs is the way to go and also reduce the foreign, uh, depends on foreign energy, which is the point that I perhaps am more uh, perhaps realistic on where natural gas uh, would come in. In terms of how it is difficult to get uh, domestic natural gas production, right, um, for unconventionals. Now conventionals, if you look at the big uh, companies, they are definitely increasing production, right? But for imports, you know, if you talk about LNG, you have to go through South China Sea. If you talk about, talk about land base, then you have to come from Russia or maybe Central Asia. And the ones from Central Asia are extremely expensive because it's just really far away. So then, are there more low-hanging fruits? In particular, when you have an electric system that is based more on potential renewables down the road or increasing share, and the electric cars, which can actually do low shifting right. and all that. And so you might actually need less capacity going forward. And so where is the, yes, gas demand will grow. It's just that to what extent it might grow. So I think that's where um, it would be a fascinating discussion perhaps down the line. Thank you. Please, sir. Um, Peter Burgess, True Value Metrics. Um, I, I'm impressed by the amount of carbon emissions per capita in the United States. Thank you. Um, could somebody <laughs> respond to this? I mean, this is the most inefficient economy on the planet. So, you know, we've, we've talked a lot about China, but what about here? Uh, that goes into the category of a, an entirely fair point that uh, could uh, occupy a, should occupy a very serious uh, further uh, program. And in fact, I'll use it as a preview of coming attractions that we will be doing other elements in this year-long speaker series entitled Where Next on Climate that will focus exactly on the opportunities inside the United States. Um, the, the flip way of responding to your question would be to say that we have enormous uh, opportunity for improvement. The more serious response, I would say from my side, is that this is a, an enormous challenge in a, a political context in which, at the federal level, I stress that, there is not the least bit of intention to focus on those questions. Now, at many of our states' uh, capitals, the focus on climate, energy efficiency, our own emissions continues to be very much front of mind. As a matter of fact, uh, Governor Brown from California next week will be in Bonn leading a delegation with this, uh, the U.S. Climate Alliance 
to, to make the point that we in the United States understand how much work there is for us still to do and that it can be done on a basis that is economically advantageous uh, to pursue. Uh, colleagues, I don't know whether others want to come in on this. Kelly, you've obviously spent time also on the U.S. side of the climate and energy uh, challenge. David, others as well. Anyone want to? Well, let me just say you're, you're quite right, of course, that U.S. per capita emissions are very high. But I'd also say it's important to realize that under the Obama administration, uh, emissions peaked, to absolute emissions peaked, and we're on a sharp, sharp downward trajectory now. And per capita emissions have also peaked and are on the decline. So we still have a long way to go. Uh, but I think it's, it's actually really important to recognize that this transition has actually appears to have occurred. Um, and, and it occurred without causing economic wreckage, you know, as many had forecast. And so uh, I think we can have quite a, a lot of confidence now that we could, you know, with more enlightened leadership, um, do much, much more in this country. There's a lot of scope for ways to reduce emissions, and we have a lot of technological ingenuity to do that in this country. No, no country has cut emissions more in the past decade than the United States of America. Period, full stop. <laughs> Please, next question. Hi, uh, I'm Mima. I'm a current student here at SIPA. Um, actually, it's a good segue to my question because I read an article um, a few days ago, actually, about um, how there was a, there's going to be a confusion and changing dynamics in the bond negotiations because there's going to be two rival um, delegations, just one is Trump's delegation, and the other would be um, Governor Jerry Brown's U.S. Climate um, Alliance delegation. Um, and I was wondering what you guys thought about the, um, how that would impact the U.S.-China relationship in the negotiations, because in the past years it's been very close, especially under the Obama administration. Um, I also read an article that you know, they would send Christmas cards to one another. So there was like this camaraderie between the U.S. and China neg uh, negotiators and how um, as a whole that would change the tone of the negotiations, seeing as that there are two groups that um, parties would have to talk to, basically. Kelly, I'm thinking of yeah. your role with the Office of the Special Envoy on Climate Change. You want to come in here? Yeah, well, I'm on my way to Bonn this Sunday, and it'll be interesting to see uh, these dynamics unfold. I actually think it's very important as a signal to the rest of the world to have uh, Governor Brown and other subnational leaders in the United States showing up in Bonn to say, we are still in. I mean, that's the, the hashtag. Um, I think it's important for, for the rest of the world to, to understand that not everyone in the United States has given up the commitment to reduce emissions um, under the Paris Agreement. And actually, you know, while I think it will be difficult for the U.S. to meet its pledge, if there's significant uh, subnational action, we stand a reasonable chance of being able to do that. Uh, so, so showing a diversity of voices is, I think, uh, quite important to keeping up the momentum in the context of the international negotiations because, in fact, there's still so much more work to be done. You know, the Paris Agreement was a really important first step, uh, but it is not adequate. It is, it is insufficient to actually fully solve the climate change problem, and so there will need to be many amendments to that Paris Agreement or many successors to the Paris Agreement going forward. So we really can't afford to have a loss of momentum in the international negotiations. Dave, please come in. I, yeah, I want to jump in, put my Cubs hat back on, because uh, one of the things that I found really ironic about uh, my leaving my job is I never thought of myself as a climate person. I mean, it really, uh, it was not, uh, I, I was not expert in the issues, and I wasn't deeply involved like the rest of you three in it. Uh, but, but uh, and so, you know, as I look at where we are now, I think about, you know, the bright side, the optimistic take is, as you say, Kelly, uh, uh, Paris wasn't enough anyway, right? And now the fact that the United States is not in Paris highlights the fact that we have to do more, that we cannot just say, I'm not a climate person, but the U.S. government's got it, the federal government's got it. I mean, I think we, it, we now have the opportunity to look as the state of Massachusetts and uh, and California and a number of other states and a number of 
institutions and organizations and individuals are trying to figure out what does it mean, how do we, how do we uh, uh, become climate people. So that's, the, uh, that's what I try to take away from where we are now. Please, I see one more question there. Hi, um, so thank you for your insights. My name is Coco. I'm also a graduate student here at CIPA. Um, actually, my question also resonates with uh, the previous ones. So in recent years, there has been this increase in the use of renewable energy for electricity generation. But at the, at the same time, there has been like huge abundance of renewable energies that's been generated, not only because of the, like, the in coordination between grids of technology, but also because of policy. So I was wondering, like, what are your thoughts about, about um, like, um, possible policies or solutions for improvement? And if you can, if there, like, are other models in not only the U.S., but also the rest of the world that can help with this? problem. Thanks. So I want to make sure that I understood your question, captured your question properly. Uh, possible models for helping With to the improve. With abandoning of renewable energies. To, to, for the deployment of, of renewable energy in China, yes? Yes. Okay. Um, colleagues, David, you want to come in? I'll, I'll start, but there's a lot of ex expertise on this here. So um, we're at a very interesting stage in the development of the renewable energy industry right now. Um, the, uh, historically, the cost of generating renewable power has been so expensive that that's been a barrier um, to the to, um, deployment of, uh, and growth of the industry, and it's required massive subsidies. Solar and wind power costs have come down so much uh, o over the course of the past decade and are projected to come down more that they're at the point that, that the cost of generating the electricity is no longer a principal barrier. The, power minister in India um, six months ago said solar power is cheaper than coal power in India. Uh, and, and so over the course of the decade or two ahead, what's likely to be the biggest barrier to the growth of renewable energy is the integration of this variable renewable power into electric grids, not just the cost of generating it. And, uh, and that's going to present some challenges because historically we've relied upon so-called baseload power to, uh, on electric grids, and now we're going to have variable power. There's um, a variety of both technical and policy changes that are required in the grid in order to, to make that work, and those are underway in a lot of countries, including China and, and the United States and India. As, as John Elkin said a few moments ago, it's this kind of striking position in China right now where China has um, more installed solar power than the United States, but generated less, um, and that's because of curtailment of that solar power due to the fact that um, there aren't the mechanisms for getting um, that electricity onto the grid. And so it, re it, it requires policy changes that um, are a little bit complicated, um, but it, 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 it requires um, marginal cost pricing um, in some ways it, um, in order to do that. It also requires uh, transmission planning so that you integrate um, the construction of power plants into the electric grid as a whole, and, and, um, and then it also requires the use of um, tools like demand response and predictive analytics, which are helpful for doing this. So um, uh, there's a lot more to say on this topic, but the clock is running, so I want and we have other people who know about this, so I want to give them a chance to talk as well. Um, and I'm happy to follow up after, the talk, uh, after this if anybody's interested in it. Brief comments further. Tony, sure. do you want to come in on this? Very quick. Um, there's technical policy and economic aspect. On a, um, basically, northern tier of China, basically a whole bunch of curtailments in, um, in wind and the solar in the northwestern part of the country. Um, technical part is that they were building too many wind farms, and then how you actually build a wind involve a technical question, because right now, our older wind farms, if you don't properly situate them, the different turbines, you have wind shear, so that it really degrades the performance of the turbine, right? So that's a technical problem that, if you have the wind uh, turbine constructed already, sometimes difficult to correct, sometimes you can correct it. That's number one. On the policy front, um, so then essentially what you look at is the demands on the East Coast, the supplies on the uh, in, in, in North and the Northwest, right? Could basically you move some industry to those locations because clearly if you build transmission lines to the East Coast, um, you might have losses on electricity and that you might not be the most efficient uh, in getting that electricity there. 
And finally is the economic front, the incentives and the proper pricing. Because right now you still have the quota system, you have the direct uh, power purchase agreement, power purchasing uh, of power. And so then perhaps down the road when you have electricity trading or something much more open market, you can have the economic system that promote that more efficient use of renewable power that's already been installed and will be installed in the future. Tony, thank you for that very good uh, concluding uh, note. Speaking of transmission, um, we need to transmit at least one of our panelists uh, to, a, to, to Penn Station. And I also am mindful <laughs> of the fact that we have exhausted the allotted time for our program today. Um, I thank uh, all of you for uh, coming, for your uh, very good questions. Uh, I think you will agree with me that this has been an outstanding panel. Um, keynoted by our friend uh, Dave Rank, but also enriched very much by Kelly Sims Gallagher, Tony Yuan, and uh, David Sandalow. Um, as I mentioned, the full video recording of this event will be available on our website in a few days. You can also subscribe to our podcast series on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and lots of other platforms that my mouth doesn't pronounce very well. Um, Last point, uh, please uh, keep your eyes peeled for uh, additional segments in our Where Next on Climate series. And let me mention as a parting shot that on Tuesday, November 21st, in Low Library across the street from 9.30 until 11, uh, David Sandalow uh, will be hosting a program focused on the uh, environmental and sustainable development implications of China's Belt and Road Initiative. That's on November 21st from 9.30 to 11. So with that, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking uh, my uh, colleagues here on the panel. Thank you all for being here as well. <laughs>